Hey guys, <clears throat> hey, what's going on? How you doing? I'm still not 100%. I'm like 95%, not 100% yet. So hopefully Protestant believer will be here by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for me. These couple of days I've been eating a little too much, but in Jesus' name, by the grace of Jesus, go back to eating better unless <clears throat> I need to lose more weight and get healthier. Protestant is here. All right. Pray for the regulars to show up in Jesus' name. Chaldean Assyrian, how are you, my brother? Good to see you. I didn't make it yesterday, as you can tell, because the timing was off. <clears throat> right? <clears throat> so we're going to do what we do best. Zina, the guy's a Christian at heart. You know he's in love with Jesus. I don't know why he keeps saying he's an atheist, but he's one of our best defenders. So, and I felt bad because I was told that he he's actually a mod on David Wood's channel. Are you a mod on David Wood's ch channel? <clears throat> May the Lord Jesus use me to bless you guys, to refresh you guys, <clears throat> that the Holy Spirit will work through me to fill you with the love and joy and peace of Jesus Christ, especially our brother Medic, because he said he had a hard day yesterday at work. Okay. Uh, it's okay, Kevin Blah. Don't worry about it. I've been around long enough. We'll wait a few more minutes for people to show up. But pray for my throat. <clears throat> I'm not 100% in perfect health yet. And also pray for the internet connection by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. There's, stay strong. Hey, David Julius, in time. I may shock you. So just stick around. Be faithful, first and foremost, to Jesus Christ. And then I'll probably make you a mod. Niles, because those are for people who are doing full-time YouTube ministry. I'm not there yet, Niles guy. God willing, in time, if everything goes my way, I've been hindered. One attack after another that's hindered me from being able to focus on learning the ropes when it comes to YouTube and beatifying it <clears throat> and using the most effective uh, methods of getting the YouTube channel to take off because I've been hindered. One setback after another, but in due course and due time in Jesus' name, I'm going to try to make this YouTube channel one of the best by the grace of God for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, Protestant believer... <clears throat> I've given him the password, but he's done nothing on my YouTube channel. I've told him download stuff, be out of flying. Guy doesn't care. It's, you know, he thinks just quoting verses is enough. Right? Anyway. My voice is a little still, you know, not completely. But anyway. <clears throat> Pray in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit fills my lungs, my chest, and throat with the breath of life. So... <clears throat> because my voice is not 100% yet. Father, we love you. <clears throat> yeah, <I know. clears throat> Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. So I ask, please, Holy Spirit, for the sake of Jesus, first and foremost, have your way in this session. Bless this session. Guide the conversation. Constrain me. Restrain me by your power for the glory of Jesus. Not to be unnecessarily offensive, but to be a blessing to the body of Jesus Christ. And Holy Spirit, please, we love you. We are in love with you, and we depend on you, the eternal spirit of the Father and his Son. Please, Holy Spirit, fill my lungs, <clears throat> my chest and throat with the breath of life. <clears throat> Grant me the health I need to be used by your power for the glory of Christ. Enable me to recall the passages and interpret them perfectly and save me from error and stammering and confusion. And Holy Spirit, fill everyone here. Fill us. Fill me. Fill those who will come and listen afterwards with wisdom and knowledge, understanding, to know the scriptures, <clears throat> to believe the scriptures, to live out the scriptures by your power, to love the scriptures, the scriptures you produce through holy men that you raise for the glory of Jesus Christ. We ask also for a powerful internet connection 
Guide us, Holy Spirit. Protect us from the children of the evil one. Bless our loved ones. In my case, my two daughters, my angels. Bless them and preserve them. We need you, Holy Spirit. We truly do. You are the sovereign, glorious, beautiful, almighty spirit of the Father <clears throat> and of Jesus Christ, his son. Fill us. And please, Holy Spirit, clear up my throat. And anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And save us from the enemy. Save us from his children. Save us from the wickedness of his corrupt courts. Please, Holy Spirit, to be free to serve Jesus Christ. We love you. Father, we love you. And Lord Jesus, we love you. In Jesus' almighty name, Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yehovah Rapha, Yehovah Rapha, Yehovah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are God. <clears throat> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are God. Yahovah Rapha, bless and heal and provide. All right. Sorry, as you can see, I'm not completely whole. I'm about 95% better. Still under the weather somewhat. Sa'ab, I'm a good actor. Do you want me to now insult Muhammad and ridicule Muhammad and expose Muhammad for the filthy dog he was? Is that what you want me to do? Sa'ab, I don't mind. Anything, anytime you say something stupid, I'll punish Muhammad for it. Pray for an internet connection. I'm close to the router as possible. Let me know if the sound is clear, the picture is clear in Jesus' name. Okay, let me just do this. Let me turn off the internet here. Maybe it'll help. help. I got hiccups. Can you believe it? My goodness. When it rains, it pours. All right. Everything good? Oops. All right. Oh, man, I got hiccups now. Oh, boy. <clears throat> okay. What I want to do today, <clears throat> if my voice lets me, oh, my goodness. If my voice lets me, I'm going to explain what the Bible teaches about God the Father. Oh, wow, Joe. Got to quit it. I don't know if he did. Isn't it a beautiful thing? I'm about to talk about scripture, and you guys are more excited about Trump. Hold on, hold on. Why don't I do this? I'm going to put on the TV set. We're going to watch Fox News because Trump got acquitted because that's more important than talking about scripture. What do you guys think? <laughs> you guys are classic, dude. Seriously. We're about to talk about God the Father. Oh, wow. Trump got acquitted because Trump. He is the highest of the archangels. He came down from heaven. He's an angel human form. And if Trump gets acquitted, then there's hope for mankind. Because if he got condemned, then we're all going to hell. Oh, my goodness. Colonel Quayle, praise God you left that false church. Stop worshiping a false God and a false Jesus. What led you to leave this false God for the true triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Nope. Huh? We got praise report. Colonel Quayle used to be a modalist. Used to be a modalist. In Jesus' name, hopefully we'll get close to 200. Now. What lead made you leave? Yes, I know. William Branham was someone who was really filled of the devil. Really empowered by Satan, because I've heard that he used to do some miraculous stuff, like fire would appear visibly following him, right, on the top of his head. <gasps> How did you leave? Praise God, artist lie, another one who left another cult, Jehovah's Witnesses. Praise Jesus for you, artist lie, <gasps> and may the Lord preserve you. So, well, how did you leave? How did you guys leave? Share with us real quickly before we begin. <gasps> Hiccups in Jesus' name. Yeah, and I get upset. I'm gonna... Come on. Maybe if I look at myself, I'll scare myself. Yep. <clears throat> so you guys want to share your testimony real quick? Thank you, artist. You left over a disagree. Okay. I have no idea what that means. Praise God, Christian Karen. You left. The false teaching of Buddhism for the true God and Savior. And now you embrace the true gospel. Praise God. All righty then. 
Hey, Zena, well, that's a great advice. Let me hold my breath in a live stream so I can pass out and waste time. In fact, I'll do it while we're watching Trump get acquitted because Medic is excited about Trump getting acquitted. Hold on. Hold on. Let me put on the channel. Yeah, baby, Trump. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And with some members. And, uh, come on, Colonel Quill. That's not a good reason to leave. Do you worship the triune God, the one true God, a Son Holy Spirit, not the modalistic God, which is a false God? Before we begin, tell some. No, he's not going to get impeached. They have no evidence for that, but that's beside the point. Okay, with that said, let's begin. I want to discuss God the Father because I was kind of troubled the last session. I was troubled by two questions, and I know people ask, right, sincerely because they want to know the answers, but it upsets me, it angers me, the level of biblical illiteracy. I was asked, how can we prove that Jesus is the Lamb in the Jehovah Witness Bible? That really upset me. If I need to prove that Jesus is the Lamb in the Jehovah Witness Bible, then I don't know what your church has been teaching you, Okay. But anyway, that's one. The second thing that upset me is the brother that was here. He's not here today. I hope he comes back, hopefully. Clara, thank you, sister. If only I can find a godly woman who loves Jesus, who sold out for Jesus, who's in love with Jesus, who's gorgeous, drop that model, that would care for me that way. Okay? I got water here. Anyway, don't hate haters. Okay, anyway. Let me let me know if the sound is good and the picture is good that it's not buffering. Okay, now what was what I was saying is this gentleman asked me, where does it say that God is the Father? And I stood there and I paused in shock, disbelief, that God by nature is a father. And I sat there and I'm like, my goodness, what's going on today? God bless you guys. Hey Sai Christian, what's up, bro? Thank you. Don't forget, Sai, we know each other. You can actually actually do Chase, and I'll get every penny that you send me. Because when you send it to me on Super Chat, they take 30%. Of all the haters, you should know this. What a hater, bro. But thank you anyway. I'm just going to get now 70% of that. But thank you. Beggars can't be choosers, right? Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about – now, again, let me say this clearly, and I hope I'm coming clear and – the Lord anoints the sound of my voice, <clears throat> gives me the health I need to serve you guys. Not everyone believes this. You have Christians who are Trinitarians who don't think that Jesus has always been the son. Let me explain that. Guys, make sure you're listening now. Now this is where we get serious, right? Okay. There are Christians who are Trinitarians I just said, well, thank you, Sai Christian. What a hater, bro. <gasps> I want to bust my head against the wall with these hiccups. All right. There are Christians who are Trinitarians. Trinita tr Trinitarians. That believe that Jesus is an eternal divine person. You guys listening? You got to get this so I don't confuse you. They do believe in the Trinity. They believe Jesus is an eternal divine person. He's not a creature. But he didn't exist as the son. He was the eternal word, the logos, and he became the son at the incarnation. One of the most famous <clears throat> proponents of this position. I was trying to look for the proper term. You know what it is? One of the most famous apologists that believe what I just said. The Father hasn't always been the Father. Jesus hasn't always been the Son. Even though he was a Trinitarian and believed there are three eternal persons, one of whom becomes the Son. Bill Craig, William Craig is one of them. Excellent. But someone, I won't say more famous, used to be the most famous apologist in the 80s. The late Walter Martin. The late Walter Martin. Did you know that? The late Walter Martin. In his book, The Kingdom of the Cults, which was a classic, he actually says, 
Jesus is an eternal person. He's a second person of the Trinity, but he wasn't always the Son. He wasn't always the Son. He became the Son at the Incarnation. And up until not too long ago, recently, you know who also believed that? <clears throat> you know who also believed that? John MacArthur. John MacArthur also believed that Jesus, though he's eternal and the Trinity is the true God, Jesus wasn't always a son, became the son at the incarnation, but then he changed his position. John MacArthur changed his position. But if you get his older commentaries, you'll find in his older commentaries where he says that. Okay, so why am I mentioning it? You can still be a Trinitarian. Pay attention, folks. In Jesus' name, may he be glorified and bless the session for his glory by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can still be a Trinitarian. Believe there's one eternal God who exists in three eternal persons and deny the eternal sonship of Christ. In other words, William Lane Craig, Walter Martin, they are Trinitarians. They defend the Trinity. They love the Trinity and believe the Trinity is the true God. But they don't believe that Jesus has always been the Son or the Father has always been the Father. Now, that view is novel. That view is not historic. And I don't believe it's biblical. So though you believe you can believe this, I believe that if you read the Bible carefully and prayerfully, you will come to the conclusion the Father has always been the Father, Jesus has always been the Son, and the Spirit has always been the Spirit. So these are not simply roles they assume in respect to creation, that Jesus becomes the Son after creation, after he enters the blessed womb of his blessed mother by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? <clears throat> I believe these are who they are in of themselves apart from creation. In other words, before creation in eternity, the Father is the Father to the Son. Jesus is the Son to the Father, and the Spirit is the eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son. This is who they were in reference to one another in eternity before creation. That's what I believe. Well, it, it is within biblical Christianity, yes. I don't believe Molinism is a damnable heresy. Better question, Pearl K.O., is, is not so much is it biblical because I'm not a Molinist and I'm not a scholar of Molinism, so I'd be speaking out of ignorance. Better question is, is Molinism or is Calvinism or is Arminianism, even open theism, are these acceptable positions to hold by those who profess to be Bible-believing Trinitarian Christians? Yes. <clears throat> yes. So if you're a Molinist, <clears throat> you are a Christian. Right? If you're, when I say Molinist, obviously if you're a Trinitarian and you love Jesus, born of the Spirit. Even an open theist, I allow for even open theists to be brothers and sisters in Christ. So these are not positions that are damnable. In other words, if Molinism is wrong, that doesn't damn you to hell. If Calvinism is wrong, that doesn't damn you to hell. If open theism is wrong, that doesn't damn you to hell. That's what I believe by the grace of the triune God. Now, Pearl, why are you asking me about the Deuterocanonicals? You see what the title is, right? Jehovah's Witnesses and God the Father. Do you want me to change the subject, Pearl Kale? Or do you want me to go back and let's talk about Trump and the impeachment? Stronghold, if you go back, <clears throat> if you go back on my YouTube channel in one of the previous sessions, I did a session where I demonstrated the strong likelihood that the three persons in Genesis 18 are the members of the Godhead, that the three persons are human appearances, human manifestations of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the Father, Son, Holy Spirit appeared in human form, assumed human likeness, human shape, appeared as men, right? Notice what they're asking me, Shoei Brasuli. I don't know, with that kind of name, I'm scared to answer you. Who are you, Shoei Brasuli? I'm about to begin the topic. Shoei Brasuli, are you a Muslim? Are you a Christian? Shoei Brasuli. Okay, so guys, with that as a background, <clears throat> can I go into the topic? 
Pro KO. This is the second strike pro. You know, I love you for the sake of the Lord. But when I see people are not able to keep along and follow, that means this channel is not for them. And I may send you on your merry way. Did you not just hear me say pro KO? I just finished saying that if you hold to Molinism and you're wrong, that doesn't damn you to hell. You're still a Christian. So pro KO, why aren't you listening? I'm just wondering why you're not able to listen. Are you really listening? Because this channel will be of no benefit to you if you're not listening. Thank you, James. <laughs> Appreciate it. Now, Pearl KO, I'm going to rebuke myself. And I'm going to see I'm an equal opportunist. I rebuke everyone myself. Shame on me, Pearl. Darn me. May God forgive me and have mercy on me for thinking I read what you wrote correctly. And I don't want to pass the buck like Adam and Eve did. But my eyesight is not what it used to be. Sorry, Pearl. You didn't ask me about Molinism. But if you look at the spelling Molinism and modalism, they almost look the same. Forgive me, Pearl, for being a jerk. You're a jerk, Sam. I'm going to block you from your own YouTube channel. Dummy. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Pearl. You scared me for a minute. So I am now strike one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the admins ban me. Because I'm a jerk. I Honestly, I'm sorry. And this is not an excuse. My eyesight is very bad. It's the worst it's ever been. I'm 47, and my eyesight is bad. I'm going to start wearing glasses. Really. Right? So, no, modalism. Let me, let me answer your question, Pearl, so I can get to the topic. Guys, we're going to focus on the topic. <clears throat> and by the way, John K., it's not 1 John 6. There's only five chapters in 1 John. It's 1 John 5, 7 to 8. Specifically, 1 John 5, verse 8. Okay, now, let me answer the question. Modalism is a false doctrine. The modalistic God is a false God. It's a satanic counterfeit to the true God. If someone who has heard the clear articulation of the Trinity and the biblical basis for the Trinity and still reject it as false, that person is not a Christian. That person is of the devil until he or she repents. So if you're a modalist and you've heard the Trinity clearly articulated, explained clearly, and given the ample proof showing Father, Son, Holy Spirit are three different persons eternally existing in intimate love and communion, and you reject it, you are not a Christian, you're a child of the devil. But there are modalists who are ignorant of modalism and Trinitarianism, and only call themselves a modalist because they don't know any better. They don't know what the Trinity is. They don't even know what the modalist is. They are in a different camp. And I believe God will show them grace and mercy. You with me there? Did that answer your question, Pearl? Did I answer your question? This is what I believe. I may be wrong. I'm not the judge. You're not going to stand before my judgment seat. Right? So I was I right, Dutch Mitch? She did say modalism, right? Wait, 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 wait. So I was right, Pearl. You actually misspelled it. You meant to say modalism, but you, spe you spelled it Molinism. Thank you, bro. All right, it's okay. Pearl, it's all right. Because your name is Pearl, you get a pass. Because you are the pearl of great price. You're the pearl that Jesus likened to the kingdom, right? Where a man bought the field so he can have that pearl, right? But don't think you can get away with mistakes. This is the last time you'll make a mistake. So here I am condemning myself for your mistake. You truly are the daughter of Eve. David does put people on timeout. He doesn't block them. Correct yourself, David. Rescind this. He puts people on timeout. He, and he rarely blocks them. But anyway, with that said, in Jesus' name, let's begin. Now you guys are ready? God the Father. Before I can get into using the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove the Trinity, I'm going to explain why I believe God is the Father, the Father is God, that God is the Father by nature, and that he's always been the Father. So are we ready in Jesus' name? You guys ready? Because this is going to be meat. 
I promise you, if you listen carefully and ask the Spirit to help you to focus and ask the Spirit to protect me from being distracted, you will see meat, and you're going to fall more in love by the grace of God with the God that exists, the God of the Bible. Okay, now, the term God in the Greek New Testament. Okay, New Testament written in Greek. Okay, the term for God is theos. This term for God appears over 1,300 times. In fact, one scholar even gives the exact number of times the word theos is used in the standard cr uh, critical Greek New Testaments that are used to produce our English translations. Over 1,300 times, pay attention, the Greek word for God, theos. About 99% of those times, guys, this is where I really need you to listen. 99% of those times, the word God is used for the person of the Father. In other words, unlike the way Trinitarians use the term God today, because usually when I say God to a Trinitarian, he's thinking God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. That's not how the word God is used in the New Testament. 99% of the time, the word for God in the New Testament, specifically the Greek, theos, the Greek word is theos, is used for the Father to such an extent that if you ask what is the name of the Father in the New Testament, it's God. That would function as his name. So the word God, the Greek word theos, functions as the Father's proper name. It's not a proper name, but it functions that way. And you guys know what a proper name is. A proper name is Sam, Tom, Henry, right? So if you're to ask me, what is the Father's name in the New Testament? It's God. With that said, here's where you're going to learn. I may not be entertaining, but I'm going to try to be educational because I want to teach you the meat of scriptures by the power of the Holy Spirit, as long as the Holy Spirit saves me from Satan and his children, from a corrupt legal system, and gives me the health I need, and makes me holy for the glory of Christ, I will serve you and teach you the word by his grace. Right? Okay, now, the word God, 99% of its occurrences is used in reference to the Father. It appears over 1,300 times. 99% of those times are used in reference to the Father. Now, the word Lord is used mostly for the Son. The word Lord is used mostly for the Son. So God is used most often for the Father. The word Lord is used most often for Jesus. So in the New Testament, Jesus is distinguished from the Father by identifying him as Lord in contrast to the Father being identified as God. And the Greek word for Lord is Kyrios or Kyrios, yes. Okay. I don't know what TMH cannot die means. Columbus Hebrew, if you're going to listen, listen. If not, I'm going to send you back to Columbus, Ohio, so you can lick the ground. Okay. You with me there? Oh, the Most High. Oh, this is the guy's the most idiot. So the most idiot says... The most I cannot die, Jesus died, because the most idiot is begging the question, because he assumes Jesus isn't the most high. This is what we call begging the question, circular argumentation, so much for your kindergarten education, right? This is what happens when you go to kindergarten in Columbus, Ohio. Don't call me your mother's pet name. Send this dog on his way. Go lick the ground like the dog you are. Bow, wow, wow. That's a classic example of circular arguments. Let me explain to you what I mean, circular argument. The most high cannot die. Jesus died, therefore he's not the most high. This is what we call begging the question, circular argumentation. Now let me reverse it. Jesus is the most high. Jesus died, therefore the most high can die. You see how stupid his argument is? No, he's one of these fake black Hebrew Israelites. These fake quacks, right? So notice how I reverse the logic. Jesus is the most high. Jesus died, therefore the most high can die. But in his stupidity, being a moron, an idiot who hasn't passed kindergarten, he thinks that Jesus isn't the most high, and therefore the most high can't die. Okay, now with that said, did you get the first point? 
The term God, the term God in the New Testament, 99% of its occurrences, the term God is used for the Father so that it functions as his name, right? So if you ask me, Sam, what is the name of the Father in the New Testament? It's God. Did you get that part? I want to make sure you got that part so I can move on to the next part. Everyone get it? Everyone, it's no one's confused so far. Okay. Why is that important? Because the Bible says that God is the Father, the Father is God. That's who he is. That's his identity. That's his personal identity. That's who he is. That's not who he became. That's who he is. Now let me prove it to you. Now are you ready for the proof? That God is the Father, the Father is God. The one God is the Father, the Father is one God. So to be the one God is to be the Father. That's who the God of the Bible is, the one God. That doesn't mean Jesus isn't God in nature or the Spirit isn't God in nature. I'm simply stating a fact. When the term God is used, 99% of its occurrences, it's used in reference to the Father, thereby identifying the one God as the Father, who's one with the Son and the Spirit. No, Braxton. God... Braxton, can you get out of here, dude? Go back to the dog pond that you came from. Send Braxton on his merry way. All right. Anyway, for the rest of you who are listening and not these clowns, these heretics. Okay. Let me prove it to you. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. This is going to be important in establishing one of the points I made in the previous session. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Watch here. And then I'm going to show you how to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible to your advantage. For there is actually to us one God, the Father. Did you guys catch it? Now he's quoting the Jehovah's Witness Bible, the New World Translation, which you can read online for free by going to jw.org. Jw.org. Their Bibles are available for free online. Notice the one God is the Father. Did you guys catch it? There's actually to us one God, the Father, from whom all things are and we for him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things are and we through him. Through Him. So did you catch it? According to New Testament, if you're the one God, you're the Father. If you're the one Lord, you're Jesus Christ. So if you're the one God, you're the Father. That's who you are. Clear? Is it making sense? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. So pay attention, folks. Pay attention carefully. And I hope Zena's paying attention too. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. For they themselves keep reporting about our first contact with you and how you turn to God from your idols to slave for a living and true God and to wait for his son from the heavens. Did you catch it? The living and true God has a son, Jesus Christ, whom he raised up from the dead, namely Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. So notice, well, here's another reference that says, the living and the true God is the father of Jesus. The living and the true God has a son, and his son is Jesus whom he raised from the dead. So notice, if you are the living and true God, if you're the one God, you're the father. Specifically, the father of Jesus, Jesus is your son. And you're going to see why that's important in connecting this with the Trinity. We're going to get there. But are you seeing that? Everyone got that one? Everyone got it? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. If someone's confused, let me know. Say, hey, man, I'm confused. Because if you get this, this is going to open your mind and blow your minds away by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to be like, wow, how amazing is this book? And how amazing is the God of this book? Okay, Ephesians 4, 6. Notice, one God... And Father of all. Notice the one God is the Father again. So to be the one God is to be the Father. To be the Father is to be the one God. It's connected. It's linked. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So are you seeing the repeated pattern? Now in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5.
Watch what happens here. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, a man, Christ Jesus. So notice, whoever the one God is, he's differentiated from the man, Christ Jesus. So in this context, the one God is different from the man, Christ Jesus. Now, who is that one God that the man, Christ Jesus, mediates for? The Father. Are you seeing it again? Whoever this one God is, he's distinguished from the man, Christ Jesus. And Jesus Christ, the man, mediates before that one God. That's the Father again. Are you seeing the pattern? John 17, verses 1 to 3. You're going to see where I'm going with this. And if you get this point, it's going to open up your minds to something amazing. Yes. Uh, Tutin, we're using the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove the Trinity, and that's what he's quoting. John 17, verses 1 to 3. What's going on is you better listen to the subject. I want to bounce you and muzzle you. John 17, verses 1 to 3. Jesus spoke these things, and raising his eyes to heaven, he said, pay attention now to who he's talking to. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. So I am your son whom you glorify in the same way that I, your son, glorify you. So they're connected. They're linked again. Just as you have given him authority over all flesh so that he may give everlasting life to all those whom you have given to him. Now notice three. This means everlasting life. They're coming to know you, the only true God, and the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. Did you catch it? The only true God is the Father, specifically the Father of Jesus, his Son, the Father of the Son, the Son whom the Father glorifies the same way that the Son glorifies him. So did you catch it again? Did you catch it again? One God, the Father. One God and Father of us all. The true and living God who raised up his son, Jesus Christ. One God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The only true God, the father of Jesus, the son of the father, whom the father glorifies in the same way the son glorifies him. Did everyone catch it so far? That the repeated pattern in the New Testament. God is the father, the father is God. The one God is the father, the father is one God. So that's part of his identity. That's part of who he is. If you're the one God, you're the Father. And you even find it in the creeds. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father. The Nicene Creed. One God, the Father. Even in the creeds, you find this articulation. Because they're simply repeating what the Bible teaches. Everyone getting this? So what's the point? Let me repeat it. If you're the one God, you're the Father. If you're the Father, you're the one God. If you're the only true God, you're the Father. If you're the Father, you're the only true God. But the Bible says the Father is the Father because of the Son. He's the Father to the Son. The Father is the Father because of the Son. He's the Father to the Son. That is part of his identity, that he, the one God, is the Father to the Son. That's part of his identity. Let me repeat again. The one God is the Father to the Son, the Father of the Son. That's part of his identity, to be the Father of Jesus. The one God is the Father of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. You're going to see where I'm going with this. So hopefully after this session, I will not be asked this question anymore. Okay, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch it? The God and Father. If you are the one God, you're the Father of Jesus Christ. Exactly, Medic. That's where I'm going with this. Send Gamer on his merry way to his vomit like the filthy dog that he is. Send him out of here. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of tender mercies and the God of all comfort. Did you catch it again? 
The one God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the one God. He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You getting it? Okay, now, Ephesians 1.17. Ephesians 1.17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Notice, the God of Jesus is the Father of glory. The Father of Jesus is the one God. You see how it's tied in? If you're the God of Jesus, you're the Father. If you're the Father of Jesus, you're the one God. You see how important Jesus is to the identity of the one true God? He is the, he is the one who makes the one God the Father. The Father is the Father because of Jesus being his son. The one God is the Father because he's the Father of Jesus. Yes, that is it, yeah. A spirit of wisdom means that God has given you wisdom by his spirit. Spirit of revelation is that God has given you revelation by the spirit. The problem is, Andrew, is that because the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe the spirit is a person, they put the S in lowercase, lowercase s, to depersonalize him. Don't forget, Andrew, this is the Jehovah Witness Bible. Everyone getting it so far? Man, I'm getting excited for you. That's Colossians 1.15, Chris Dino. I already did multi-part session on Colossians 1.15. Firstborn, it's on my YouTube. I did it about a month ago. You got to listen. Say, save the lost. I'm about to block you because you see I'm talking about God the Father and you're more interested in annihilationism. So that's all you care about is the doctrine of annihilationism. Forget the Trinity. Forget who the Father is, the Son is, the Holy Spirit, because preaching your doctrine of annihilationism is more important. Are you that much of a joke that that's what you want to focus on instead of something this important? The fatherhood of God? Huh? And now uh, coming back to the issue. The audacity of some of these, these jokes, these clowns. I'm talking about a serious topic, the fatherhood of God, that it's essential to God, his identity, that he's the father, and how that ties into Jesus and shows the glory of the Trinity. And you, what about annihilationism, Sam? Because you see, that's more important than knowing who God is. See, if I get annihilationism right, I go to heaven. But if I don't know who God is, that doesn't matter. Stupid idiot morons. You wonder why I get angry. Sorry, guys. You don't like it? There's other preachers for you. What's more important? Knowing who God is and loving him truly as he is or annihilationism? Anyway, coming back to the issue. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Let's just read verse 1. Hebrews 1 verse 1. In fact, I'll prove it to you, Angela. Didn't you just read John 17, verse 3? This is everlasting life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. He didn't say, this is everlasting life, to know annihilationism. That's stupid, man. That's dumb, stupid people in this world. My goodness, man. And you wonder why I'm losing it. You see, John 73 should have actually said, this is eternal life, that they may know the doctrine of annihilationism. See, and I'm so cool. I know it. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Hebrews 1, verse 1. Marcy, annihilation is a doctrine that even Arnold Murray held to. Arnold Murray believed that when you went to hell, you'd go there for a period of time and then we wiped out of existence, annihilated, so you won't suffer forever. It's a doctrine that's spreading among evangelicals, but this is not the time for me to discuss that topic. God willing, I'll discuss it in the near future. Right? That's what annihilationism is. And Marcy, if you followed Arnold Murray, Arnold Murray used to believe that as well. 
I don't know what this guy's saying. He's saying when Jesus was tempted by Satan, if he took Satan's offer, would Satan have stolen God's identity of Christ? No, it would have pitted the members of the Godhead against each other, Alexander. What that would have done is it would have pit the Son against the Father, showing that there's disunity, disharmony in the Godhead, which is impossible. It cannot happen. So Satan failed. But I promise you, Alexander, I'll do a session on how could Satan tempt Jesus if Satan knew Jesus is God in the flesh? Remind me to send you my articles. I did two articles on that where you can read my response, but I'll do a session on that, God willing. If you guys are interested, I'll do a session on how can Satan tempt Jesus if Satan knew Jesus is God? But now coming back to the issue, Hebrews 1.1. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Long ago, God spoke to our father, forefathers by means of the prophets on many occasions in many ways. God did this. Who is this person called God? Verse 2. Who is this person called God that spoke to the Israelites in the past through the prophets in various ways and on many occasions? Now at the end of these days, he has spoken to us by means of a son. So the God who spoke is the father of Jesus, and Jesus is his son. Did you catch it, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2? Long ago, God spoke to our forefathers by means of the prophets on many occasions, many ways. Now at the end of these days, he has spoken to us by means of a son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the systems of things. Did you see the repeated pattern? God is the father. The father is God. The one God is the father. The father is the one God. The one God is the father of Jesus. Jesus is the son of the living and true God. Are you seeing how the New Testament defines the term God? Are you seeing it? What did I say? Over 1,300 occurrences of the word God in the New Testament. 99% of the time, the term God is used of the Father. It functions as his name. He is the Father. The Father is God. In union with the Son and the Spirit. After all, if Jesus is truly the spiritual offspring of God, his true Son, that means he shares the nature of his Father. Well, if Jesus' Father is God, he shares in the nature of his Father, and his Father's nature is that of God, that means the Son is God too. You see how it works? You with me there? Is there is he seeing the pattern? Okay, now, why am I making this an issue? If I am correct, the one God is the Father. That's an important part of his identity. That's who he is. He is the Father. That's part of his identity as the one God. Then it, it makes sense that because God is the Father, that what God creates, he doesn't create servants. He creates families. And what's the first thing he created? Or I, I should say, what is one of the most important things he created? Is the family in Genesis 1. Let us make Adam in our image. Male and female, he made them, called them Adam, and told them, be fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth. So because God is the father by nature, he goes about and creates families in heaven and earth. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. Why do you think white lipstock, there is a great concerted satanic effort to destroy the family? Because family is a reflection of the heart of God. Why do you think there is a great concerted satanic effort to destroy the roles in a family, to masculinize the woman and feminize the man, so that the entire family structure is destroyed and the children lose their identity. They don't know what they are anymore. And here, here's the passage to prove what I just said. Here's the passage to prove what I just said. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this reason, 
I bend my knees to the Father to whom every family in heaven on earth owes its name. Did you catch it? There are families in heaven and on earth. God created a family in heaven and God created a family on earth. Why? Because he's the Father. Being the Father, he produces families, heavenly and earthly. That's who he is. Did you catch it? One more time. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. Let it sink in. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. Let it sink in. For this reason, I bend my knees to the Father, to whom every family in heaven and on earth owes its name. If you're a family, you owe that to God the Father. You're a family because God is the Father who created and produced a family on earth. And he did that in heaven. Everyone catching it? Why do you think there's such a great effort to destroy families? Divorce so you can destroy children. Masculizing women so they can usurp the God-given role to the father. Feminizing the father so that he takes on the role assigned to the woman in order to destroy the children, produce dysfunctional misfits that produce dysfunctional societies. This is Satan's attack on the very thing that God loves from the depth of his being because it reflects who God is. Is it making sense now? Is it sinking in? I just want to make sure it sinks in. So now my question to you, according to Ephesians 3, 14, 15, why did God create families, not simply slaves? Why did he create families? Because he's the father. You see the answer? Because God is a family. Family consisting of father, son, and Holy Spirit. And because God is a family, God is the father. He creates families in heaven and on earth. Is it making sense? So if this is making sense, let's go to the next point. I hope it's making sense to every one of you guys. Because this is me I'm giving you. Right? I don't know if I read your lips tomorrow. I didn't see your lips move. Thank you, Mr. You right. I hope that's a blessing. Okay, now. Let's go to Acts 17, 24 to 28. Now let's break this down because now you're going to see just how important Jesus is. That the Father is the Father because of Jesus. Okay? Here, Acts 17, 24 to 28. This is what I need you to read now. This is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. We're using their own Bible against them. The God who made the world and all things in it, being as he is, Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in handmade temples, nor is he served by human hands. This is what I want you to pay attention. Notice 25. He doesn't need human beings to serve him. He doesn't need anything from you. You can't give him anything because he has everything he needs in of himself. He's self-sufficient, self-existent. Nor is he served by human hands as if he needs anything because he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Now watch here. And he made out of one man, literally one blood, he made out of one blood every nation of men to dwell on the entire surface of the earth. And he decreed the appointed times and the set limits of where men would dwell so that they would see God in if they might grope for him. Now notice 28. Notice again, God as father again. For by him we have life and move and exist, even as some of your own poets have said, for, for we are also his children. He didn't create slaves. He created children in heaven and earth. Did you catch it? We're all his offspring. He's our spiritual father who gives us spiritual and biological life and everything we need to live. Now, who is the God here that did this? Who is Paul talking about? Let's read 29 to 31. Notice again, who is this God that we are his offspring, his children? 
Acts 17, 29 to 31. Therefore, since we are the children of God, pay attention who it is. Therefore, since we are the children of God, all the way 31, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, like something sculptured by the art and design of humans. Now notice 30 to 31. Watch here. True, God has overlooked the times of such ignorance, but now he is declaring to all people everywhere that they should repent. Now, 31, because he has set a day on which he purposes to judge the inhabited earth in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and he has provided a guarantee to all men by resurrecting him from the dead. Since that man is Jesus, who is this God that raised that man, Jesus, to life? Who is this God that we are his children? It's not the Trinity here. It's not the Trinity. God the Father. So it's saying we are all the children of God the Father. And we know it's God the Father because it says he's the one who raised this man Jesus to life and will send that man Jesus to judge. Is it now sinking in to be the one true God? You must be the Father. And if you are the Father, you are the one true God. This is not simply a role he assumed. It's something he is by nature. The one God is the Father by nature. Is it making sense before I move on? Is it making sense before I move on? Now you see how satanic, as Anna Growing mentioned, the Quran is, and that the Quran assaults the very identity of the true God. The Quran says that Allah of Muhammad is not a father to anyone and he has no children. And a, a direct attack and assault on who the true God is. And you're going to tell me that the Muslim God is the same God that you worship? Is it all sinking in? Is it making sense? Before I move on. Exactly, Andrew Martin. The Muslim God created slaves. The true God revealed in Jesus created families. The Muslim God created slaves, even though he doesn't exist. I'm just saying for argument's sake, according to the Quran. But the one true God revealed in Jesus Christ created families. One means yes, Leon. It's a code we use. One means yes, two means no. Now, before I move on to the meat of the matter, how many of you guys just fell more deeply in love with the true God of the Bible? Just seeing the beauty and the clarity of Scripture and showing that the one true God is the Father, which is why he creates families in heaven and earth. Now, can you imagine if this God was other than the Father? If this, if the God we serve was some cruel, wicked, heartless, merciless tyrant? How could we escape such a God? But notice the God that exists. The one God is the Father. That's why he loves us with a perfect, infinite love and desires, us, desires for us to be part of his family. And you see why family is so important to God. And why, if you love the true God revealed in Jesus, the one God who's the father of Jesus, you have to fight for the family. Fight of the unborn child to live, right? You have to fight for the right of traditional marriage because the one true God, when he created family on earth, Male and female coming together to produce children, not male and male or female and female, and only two genders, male and female, that's it. Everything else is of the devil, of the enemy, of Satan. And you have to fight for it, folks, because that's who the God is that you serve. A God who is a family in of himself a God who created families in heaven on earth, and the family on earth he created consists of male gender, one born male gender, one born female gender, coming together, producing children, a family to reflect the family we call God.
Everyone got it? Why you need to be passionate for the things that your God loves? And he's passionate about the family. He's passionate about children. He loves children. And he wants families to produce godly children. That's one of the reasons why he hates divorce so much. Malachi 2, 15 and 16. Malachi 2, 15 and 16. Christian Karen, when you get there, I hope you look better than you do now. Right here. Malachi 2, 15 and 16. But there was one who did not do it, for he had what remained of the Spirit. And what was that one seeking? The offspring of God. So notice why he hates divorce. He was, this, he was looking for offspring for himself. So guard yourselves, respecting your spirit, and do not deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says Jehovah God. Did you catch it? What did God want from these families? Godly offspring. Raise up children for me. Children who know me, love me, and know how much I love them, and I'm in love with them. That's why I don't want you to divorce, because when you divorce, you destroy my children. And I'm a, I'm, I'm a proof of it. Many of you are a proof of it. I am the byproduct of a divorced home that has scarred me mentally, emotionally, physically till this day. And Jesus, my healer, Jesus Rafa, Jesus, my healer, is healing me slowly, daily, to make me what he intended me to become, right? And why I ache for my daughters. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Many of you are the byproduct of broken homes and bad parenting or divorced homes. And look the irreparable damage it's done. My ex-wife, pray for God to have mercy on her. She's a creature of God that God will convict her. Because she was raised in a broken home, alcoholic dad, a gambler who abused her, look how messed up she is. That because she's hurt, she hurts others. May God have mercy on her and forgive her and restore her in Jesus' name. And Satan knows this. Satan knows this. Let me destroy the family. I destroy the children. And why do I want to destroy the children? Because God loves the children and wants godly children to know him and fall in love with them as he's in love with them. And Jesus himself said, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. You can read it. It's a long passage. We won't read it now. But write down Matthew 18, verses 1 to 14. Matthew 18, verses 1 to 14. Jesus says, you better enter the kingdom like this child. Because the kingdom is made up of these, these children. Matthew 18, verses 1 to 14. And then Matthew 19, verses 13 to 15. Let's read that. Matthew 19, verses 13 to 15. I hope at least this session got you to appreciate families even more and that the Spirit puts a fire in your heart to be passionate about saving unborn children, condemning abortion as murder, and doing everything you can to produce godly families and fight for godly families. I pray this session is putting a fire in your heart to do that. Matthew 19, 13 and 15, a fire from the Spirit. Then young children were brought to him for him to place his hands on them and offer prayer. But the disciples reprimanded them. Jesus ever said, let the young children alone. Do not try to stop them from coming to me. For the kingdom of the heavens belongs to such as ones. And he placed his hands on them and departed from there. Here, Jesus, who's God in the flesh, tells you, the kingdom belongs to them. Why them, Jesus? Because my, my father is a father who creates families in heaven and earth. And he loves the family and loves children. Did you catch it? Is this sinking in? I just want to take a moment and ask again. 
Everything good is from the Holy Spirit. After seeing that God is the Father and the Godhead is a family, which is why he creates families in heaven and earth, do you see why you need to be so passionate about the family that God designed, about the lives of unborn children, about children being raised in dysfunctional homes, why you need to be fighting for that, the health of that family, the health of those children, and just being in love with the family as God is in love with the family. Honestly, is it penetrating? Just so want to make sure. Is it sinking in? Exactly, Angela Concrete. And folks, those of you who've been raised in broken homes, you know what I'm talking about. I don't mean to be a sob story. Some people's lives, much worse than I can imagine. But folks, because I was raised in a dysfunctional home, okay, and I was raised with the longing and the aching of the affirmation, the verbal affirmation of a mother who wasn't trained to verbally affirm, but she showed her love by her actions. It has left such a deep wounded scar in my heart and in my mind and in my emotions that I ache for the affirmation of a woman because that's what I wanted from my mother and I didn't get. And I'm scarred because of it. Honest to God. I'm being honest with you. See, Jesus is our pastor. Lamb. You know what I'm talking about, right? And you know the wound, the pain it leaves aching for the affirmation of a woman because you were looking for it in your mother and didn't get it. Stenson, that's referring to the children who follow in the footsteps of their parents without repentance. Then they too will suffer the punishment that fell on their parents if they continue in their footsteps and do not put an end to it, Stenson, and repent and turn to God. Because God is a God of love and forgiveness and redemption. Love you too, Chris. Okay, so... Exactly, Marcy. For some, it's a father figure. And in the case of my ex-wife, it was a father figure. She's still looking for her father and all these men. And all she ends up with is more heartache, disappointment, anger, abuse, and hate. Exactly, Whitey. In my case of mother, your case of father. But you understand, this is, this is a concerted, concentrated, Attack of the enemy because the enemy knows how much God loves family. And what does the enemy want? To destroy the thing that God loves the most. Oh, so you love family, huh, God? You love children. You want godly offspring. Guess what? I'm going to do everything I can to destroy families, to destroy children, and even legalize the murder of unborn children. Right? Soldier of Christ, are you in the YouTube channel? Thank you, brother. I just saw your text on Discord. What's vice? V-I-E-S. I have no what's vice means. I think we have a death witch that needs to be put to death in silence like a dog. Okay, now, if everyone got that, if everyone got that, we're going to go back to the Trinity and connecting the fatherhood of God with Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Is everyone ready so, so far with me? All right. With that said, let's come back. I hope everything is relevant. Everything is connected by the grace of God's spirit. Because if it's from the spirit, you'll be blessed. You'll be challenged. You'll be moved. You'll be convicted. You'll be changed. If it's from the spirit. And that's my hope. Now, let's tie it in with Jesus Christ. Let's tie it in with Jesus Christ. Let's go back to remember, I've already established, right? So you go back and re-listen to this. I've established a repeated pattern in the New Testament. The one God is the Father. The Father is the one God. The one true God, the one living and true God is the Father. The Father is the one true God, the one true and living God. He's the Father of Jesus. The one God is the Father of Jesus. The one God has a son, Jesus Christ. So that's 
We repeated it. And because he is the father, that's who the one God is. That's part of his personal identity. He creates families in heaven and earth, right? Was that clear? I gave you many passages to affirm that point. But now let's go back to Acts 17, 25. Let's tie it in. Now you're going to be in awe with Jesus. You were in awe of the Father, and you fell in love with the Father, I pray, even more. Now you're going to be in awe of his Son and see how important the Son is to the Father. Why the Father adores his Son the way he does. Acts 17, 25, and this is going to move me in my spirit. <clears throat> Every time I think about this, I get moved, and I pray the Holy Spirit will sanctify my heart, that it's from my heart that's transformed sincerely for the love of Jesus, not for the praise of men. I never, ever want to put on a show for men. Spirit saved me from myself. But when I start thinking this, it moves me in my heart because of the, the love <clears throat> that the Father has for his Son and the Son has for the Father and the love they have for the Spirit and the Spirit's love for them. Notice what it says about God the Father. Nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. So notice what it's saying. God is what we call, God has a seity. A seity means he's self-existent, self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything or anyone to be who he is. God is God and doesn't need creation. God is God and doesn't need anything from any creature. Okay, but now, guys, here's where I need you to put your thinking caps on. The one God is the Father. That's his identity. That's part of his identity. That's part of his nature. Father is a relational term. You can't be a father if you don't have someone that you're a father to. Pay attention. You can't be a father unless you have someone that you're a father to. Since God doesn't need creation to be who he is, and since the Bible says the one God is the Father, that means this one God has to be the father of someone that's not part of creation because if God needs creation to be the father, then he's not self-sufficient. Did you catch it? Not same person, no, Nightwish. They're not the same person. They're different persons, which is why they love one another and have fellowship with one another. Don't get confused. So, folks, who is that one that made God an actual father and did so without the father needing creation to be an actual father? Jesus Christ. You understand how amazing Jesus is now? And why the father is in love with the son? Because the father basically is saying, I am who I am because of who you are, my son. My son, I am who I am because of who you are. I am who I am because of you. Because of you, I am the father. <clears throat> because of you, I've always been a father before creation. Because you have always been my son, my very heart. Right? Father is a relational term. God is not a father in potential. He's an actual father. But for him to be an actual father, he has to be the father of someone. But he doesn't need creation to be who he is. And that's why Jesus is the firstborn. He's not the firstborn because he's the first one created. He's the firstborn because he is the oldest son who's just as old as his father without whom God could not be a father. <clears throat> That's right. <clears throat> because of you, my son, I am who I am. I am what I am because of you. You are my heart. You are my son. You are my beloved. I am the father because of you. So this view shows... That the Father needs the Son and the Spirit just as much as the Son and the Spirit need the Father. And they can't be what they are apart from the others. You with me there? And here's what's the most amazing thing. 
here's what's the most this is why I'm being moved in my spirit. And I pray from a heart purified by the spirit and the blood of Jesus. Here's what's the most amazing thing. You know what he said to us, world? I want you now to let it sink in. He says, I'm going to show you, you creatures, you who oppose me, you who sin against me, how much I love you. I'm going to offer up the one person who makes me what I am, the Father, who's my very heart, and I'm going to offer him up on the cross in your place. So don't ever, ever, ever question the Father's love for you. The Father has nothing to prove, nor does he need to prove anything. But he still went ahead and did it. And he goes, this is how much I love you. Son, you are the son who makes me what I am. You are my heart. And now, son, I offer your life for the world that I made for you to redeem it. And you know what the son says? You know what the son says? Hmm. Father, if that delights your heart and that's your will and this makes you happy, then it delights my heart too because my happiness is to make you happy. My joy is to make you joyful. When you are happy, I am happy. When you're joyful, I am joyful because you are my father. You are my father. And I'm in love with you. I love you. I'm in love with you. Baba. Abba. I love you. And what does the father say? <clears throat> My son, my heart, I love you. I'm in love with you. You are my heart. As I told you, it's going to move me in my spirit. I told you it's going to move me in my spirit talking about it, right? <clears throat> This is why passages like uh, John 17, 24 should move your heart. Well, now let's read it. Sorry, guys. I told you it's going to move my heart thinking about it. Well, Jesus makes people most emotional. I wish I was full of the Lord. Now here, John 17, 4. This passage should really now move you in your spirit. Watch here. Father, notice, Father. I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am in order that they may look upon my glory that you have given me. Now notice, because you loved me before the founding of the world. My father, Babi, Abba, you have been in love with me and you adore me even before the world was created. Now notice John 14, 31. John 14, 31. May God purify our hearts and our motives for the glory of Jesus, to fall more in love with him. John 14, 31. Watch here. But for the world to know that I love the Father. Do you catch it? Father, you have loved me before the world began. You've been in love with me. And so the world will know that I, the Son, am in love with the Father. I adore my Father. I love my Daddy. The world to know that I love the Father. I am doing just as the Father has commanded me to do. Get up. Let us go from here. So it gives you a different uh, perspective now, right? You see, the Father cannot be who he is apart from the Son and the Spirit. 
The Son cannot be who he is apart from the Father and the Spirit, and the Spirit cannot be who he is apart from the Father and the Son. They are inseparable. They complete one another. You remember that scene from that movie, You Complete Me? Literally, this applies to the Godhead. They complete one another. They complete one another. The Son completes the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit completes the Father and the Son. And the Father completes the Son and the Spirit. This is true love. This is unconditional love. Where the others are complete by the others, are made complete by the others, and cannot exist apart from the others. Right? Yep. Send night wish to the daytime. Is it amazing or what? So do you see why Jesus is the firstborn? Because the firstborn is what makes a, a person a parent. Right? A firstborn is what makes you a parent. For example, Netta, you have children. How old is your firstborn? How old is your firstborn, Netta? Just curious. 12. Netta is 12 years old as a mother. Netta as a mother is only as old as her firstborn. Because before she had a child, she wasn't a mother. She had the potentiality to be a mother, but she wasn't a mother in actuality. She needed a child to become a mother actually. So don't let anyone tell you that a parent is older than the child. That's not true. The parent can't be older than the firstborn because without a firstborn, you're not a parent. You with me there? So if Netta's firstborn is 12, guess how old Netta is as a mother? 12. Guess how old Netta's husband is as a father? 12. Your firstborn is what makes you a parent. Without a firstborn, you're not a parent, even if it's an adopted child. You with me there? And I can use that with anyone here. For example, is AD here? Al, are you here? But no, notice, Phantom, I just used the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove my point. This was the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Okay, Tamara. Okay, Al D. How old is your firstborn? Al D, how old is your firstborn? Yep, and God the Son requires God the Father. Okay, so Sonny, 17, right? Angela, yours, 25. So Sonny, you are only 17 years old as a father. See? And a Al is only 31 years old as a father. Because without a child, you are not a parent. It's your firstborn that makes you who you are. That's why the firstborn has special status. So now, folks... If God is the father by nature, that's part of his identity. So he's always been the father because he's always been God. Pay attention. The one God is the father. The father is the one God. Well, since the one God has always existed, he's always existed as the father. That means he's always been a father. If he's always been a father, then he has to be a father to someone. And that someone has to be just as old as him. Welcome to the eternal son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the firstborn in that he's the one who makes God what he is, the father. But since the father has always been the father, the firstborn has always been the firstborn. So firstborn, don't let the Jehovah's Witnesses deceive you. Firstborn doesn't mean the one born first who came into being. Firstborn is the status. It refers to the one who makes you a parent. So if the one God is the father and that's who he is, then he had to have been a father to someone, and that someone has to have always been around for the one God to have always been the father, and that son is Jesus. Do you see why he's special? Do you see why he's special? Is he amazing or what? He's special, isn't he? He's so beautiful. 
He's so beautiful. Who is Mary's firstborn? Who's Mary's firstborn? Jesus. So Jesus made Mary a mother like Jesus made God a father. And Mary as a mother is just as old as her human son, Jesus Christ. And God the Father, right, is just as old as his divine son, Jesus Christ. And isn't it amazing? Jesus as God has a father but no mother. And Jesus as a man has a mother but no father. Did it sink in? Jesus as God in his divine nature has a father but no mother. Jesus as man in his human nature has a mother but no father. Right? And Mary is just as old as a mother as Jesus, her human son. And God the father is just as old as a father as his divine son. Sink it in? Is it sinking in? Before I move on to one final point, right? I just want to ask you guys, did this session give you a greater appreciation of God as the Father and the importance of Jesus to God's fatherhood and make you fall more in love with the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Amazing, right? See, I'm smiling from joy. <laughs> How can you not love this God? <clears throat> God bless you, 1611. How can you not fall in love with the Father? How can you not fall in love with the Son? How can you not fall in love with the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> I don't know. Exactly, Christian Karen. It's just mind-boggling, isn't it? It's my boggling, right? Yeah. We love you, Father. I just want to take a moment and just say we love you. And Lord, I know they amen this, and they give me the right to speak on their behalf. We love you, Father. We don't love you the way we should, and we love you imperfectly. But Abba, we love you. Because of Jesus, we can call you Abba. And he is our eldest brother, your firstborn, our eldest brother. And because you are a father, Jesus is your son. You sent your spirit to produce families on earth, your spirit in our hearts, so we can be your children and share in the sonship of your beloved. Abba, we thank you. Abba, we need you. We really do. Please, Abba. Fight for us. Fight for me, your son. I am your son because of Jesus. And my trust is in Jesus. Fight for me, February 10 and February 19. Save me and set me free to serve you and bless your people. We are in love with you, Avino. And we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, son of God. <clears throat> you are so beautiful. You are so special. And you are so amazing. Truly, you are the very heart of the Father. You're the very love of the Father. <clears throat> the Father adores you, and he's in love with you. And Lord Jesus, we adore you, and we are in love with you. Bless us, Lord Jesus, and wash us in your blood, and wash our children, our loved ones, my daughters, in your blood, Lord Jesus, please. And we love you, Holy Spirit. The Father and the Son are in love with you, and we are in love with you, Holy Spirit, because you bind us to Christ and unite us to Christ and give us the right to call the Father of Jesus our Father, Abba. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let me show you those passages. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 6. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 6. A few more verses, and we're going to end this session. Lord willing, I'll do a session tomorrow. Surely you can't be serious. Right? Read this, folks. Galatians 4, 4 to 6. But when the full limit of the time arrived, God sent his son, 
who was born of a woman who was under the law, that he might release by purchase, ransom us, those under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now pay attention to six, folks. Now because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, and it cries out, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit comes to live in our hearts to give us the right to say to God, Bobby, Bobby, Baba, Abba, Avinu. The same right that Jesus has. Same right that Jesus has. Who can you turn to? Is there another God worthy of your worship? Is there another Savior worthy of your devotion and allegiance? Is there another spirit that you want apart from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit revealed in the Bible? Right? It's beautiful, isn't it? 1 John 2, 22-23. 1 John 2, 22 to 23. He's so beautiful, isn't he? He's beautiful. He is beauty. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the one God. He is beauty. Okay. Now notice this one. 1 John 2, 22 to 23. If you want proof that it's Jesus' sonship that makes God's fatherhood a reality, it's Jesus' sonship that makes God's fatherhood a reality, here you go. Who is the liar? but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and Son. Everyone who denies the Son does not have the Father either. Bam! There you go. But whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. There you go. You cannot have God as Father without Jesus as Son. You cannot have God as Father without Jesus as Son. So you see how they're connected? You need the one in order to have the other. Jesus has to be the son for the father to be truly the father. Did you see in that verse? If you deny the son, you do not have the father. If you acknowledge the son, you have the father. Did you, did you see it? Is it sinking in? Is it sinking in? Do you understand what you just read? No son, no father. You have the son, you have the, because the sonship of Christ is what makes God's fatherhood a reality. So the one God is the father. That's his identity. That's who he's been always. He's always been the father. But wait, how can you be a father before creation and not need creation to be an actual father? And he says, let me introduce you to my son, Jesus Christ. And the father says, this is my beloved son. He is the one that makes me what I am. So I don't need creation to be what I am, the father. This one, my son, whom I delight in. Now it makes you appreciate God's confession of the son even more. Let's go to Mark 1.11. Mark 1.11. Makes you appreciate it more, right? And then as a brownie point, I'll give you just one, one way of proving the deity of Christ from the Joe Witness Bible, and we'll do a session tomorrow. Notice. Now let this sink in by the power of the Holy Spirit with greater appreciation for what the Father is saying. And a voice came out of the heavens. You are my son, the beloved. I have approved you. Mark 9, verse 7. You see how special he is? <laughs> He's amazing, right? He, he, here is one who walked the earth, who could say, God is my father by nature. I am truly his spiritual son, his spiritual offspring. He truly is my father, has always been my father. I've always been my son. He's the only person that walked this earth that can say that. And a cloud formed, overshadowing them. And a voice came out of the cloud. This is my son, the beloved, my son whom I love. Listen to him. You understand? I don't know if it's sinking in. Jesus is the only person that walked this earth who can say, folks, God is truly my father by nature. I'm truly his spiritual offspring by nature. 
He's always been my father. I've always been his son. Always. Always. Right? He's the only one who can say that. Alex, XX, he's the only one who can say that. <laughs> so that means, you know what's amazing? Why it's moving my heart? You know why it's moving my heart? <clears throat> That baby in the womb of that virgin, right, was truly the spiritual offspring of God. And the father from heaven is looking and he goes, there goes my son becoming human. And then the father's looking at that baby that Mary's holding. Guys, follow me here because this is true. We're reading about a true story that truly happened. When that virgin held that baby in her arms, the father in heaven was looking down. And he's saying, I entrusted my son to you. I entrusted my heart to you. Woman, that child in your hand, though he's truly your son, he was my son first. And he's my true spiritual offspring. Take good care of my son. You see why it's amazing? You see why it's amazing? The father looking from his throne in heaven, seeing that beautiful young Jewish virgin maiden, and then the angelic host, they're watching, and they're saying to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, that's our creator, your son. And now he became a human baby. And that's his human mother. Sovereign Lord, that Jewish virgin maiden is holding your son, who's now a baby, in her arms. Wow. Wow. Right? Is that amazing? That mother of our Lord Jesus, that woman, was given an honor. No woman will ever be given. She was entrusted with the very son of the living God. Mary, I entrust my son to you. Now you become his mother. My son, there's your mother. Right? Let's end it with this now. Uh, let's end it with this. Sovereign Lord, you are amazing. Let's go to Matthew 16. Let's read 13 to 14. I know, yeah. <laughs> It's amazing. I didn't expect this to happen. Guys, I mean it when I tell you. I didn't, it wasn't planning this. This is not a show. you know. But this is what happens when I start thinking about these passages. When I start reflecting on these passages, I stand in awe of the God who lives. And folks, before I read Matthew 16, 13, 14, let me remind you, and I pray the Holy Spirit will etch this in your hearts. Folks. This God that I'm talking about, he's real. He's reality. He's alive. He's living. Jesus is alive. He's living. He's real. And we will truly see him. We will truly touch him. We will truly hug him. We will truly kiss him and be kissed by him. And we will kiss his beautiful feet. He's real. Jesus is alive. We will see him, this one that made God what he is, the Father. And you're going to see in glory, you're going to see that beautiful virgin maiden, the one that Jesus called woman. You're going to see her. And when you're going to look at her, you're going to say, you gave to my Lord and Savior his human nature and his physical body. You gave to God's true eternal spiritual offspring, 
is human nature. All right? So now let's go to Matthew 16. And I think I'll just end this. I was going to give you a brownie point, but my time is running out. I need prayers, and I'll tell you what to pray for. Are you going to hit me now? <laughs> Why is that out? <laughs> I hope it's a good hit. Okay, Matthew 16, 13 and 14. Right? When he had come into the region of Caesarea Philippi, here, this is going to blow you away. I'm going to end it with this. Jesus asked his disciples, who are men saying the Son of Man is? They said, some say John the Baptist. Others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Folks, get ready. And I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, it will blow your minds where you're going to be in awe and in tears just loving Jesus. Matthew 16, 15. Watch here. Doing what, Sydney Mills? Is it good or bad I'm doing? I don't know. He said to them, you, though, who do you say I am? Guys, watch Peter's response in Matthew 16, 16. I want to take it step by step. Matthew 16, 16. Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, here's where you're going to get blown away. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, that's who you are, the son of God. God is truly your father. Now, notice what Jesus says in response in 17, and many people don't catch this. They miss it. Watch here. In response, Jesus said to him, happy you are, Simon, son of Jonah. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this, reveal it to you, but my Father in heavens did. Guys, pay attention. This is where it's going to sink in. You are Simon, son of Jonah. Jonah's your father. Like I am Christ, the son of the living God. As Jonah is your true father, God is my true father. Wow. Did you understand what he said? See, Simon. Your father is Jonah. My father is God. Just like Jonah is your father and you are truly a son, God is my father and I'm truly his son. Did you catch it? Do you understand what he just did? Simon said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You are Simon, son of Jonah, like I am Christ, the son of God. God is my father truly, as Jonah is your father truly. You belong to Jonah, I belong to the father. Did you catch it? You understand what he's saying? It's like my dad is Hermes. I am the son of Hermes. He's my dad, no one else. And Jesus says, my dad is God and no one else. My father is God and no one else. Simon, your dad is Jonah. That's his name. No one else. That's truly your father. Just like God is truly my father, I'm truly his spiritual offspring. Did it sink in? Exactly, Revelation 22, 13, you caught it. Why do you think Jesus even mentions who Peter is the son of? Do you ever think, why are you, why are you mentioning he's the son of, what's that? Because he's trying to show you the contrast, right? Why are you mentioning Simon, son of Jonah? What's, what's the relevance? You don't get it. I'm trying to show you. Just like Jonah is truly his, his father and he belongs to him, God alone is my father and no one else, and I belong to him. You caught it? You caught it? Making sense? Now, did that, honestly, I don't know how that made you, did now it open your mind like, whoa. It's like me if I go to Al and I say, Al, son of Baba. Well, yeah, that's my father. His name is Baba, and I'm his truly his son. Al, here is Jesus, son of God. Al, Jesus, God's son. As you are Baba's son. Did you catch it now? Did it sink in? And by the way, Al's dad, his name was Baba. So it's, it's really his name. So you understand? Just like Hermes is my dad, no, no one else. Jesus says in the same way, God is my dad. He's daddy to me. 
He's daddy to me. My Baba. God is my Baba and no one else. And so let's end it with Mark 3, 31 to 35. Let's end it. Mark 3, 31 to 35. Pray that God will bless the YouTube channel. More people watch. We get more people. Hit the like button. I want to make this explode for the glory of Jesus if God is pleased. Now here, Mark 3, 31, 35. Guys, pay attention who's missing in this list. Now his mother and his brothers came, his mother and brothers came, and standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. As there was a crowd sitting around him, they said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. But he replied to them, who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at those sitting around him in a circle and said, see, my mother and my brother. Now notice what group he doesn't mention, right? Whoever does the will of God, this one is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus, how come you didn't say this one is my brother, my sister and mother and father? Why didn't you mention father, Jesus? You mentioned sister, even though it's only your mother and brothers. Why didn't you mention? You know why? Because only one is my father, God. Did you catch it? You can be my sister. You can be my brother. Even my mother. But I only have one father. And that father is God. He is my Baba. Babi. Abba. My daddy. My daddy is God. And I am his child. We love you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please forgive us. Save us from our flesh. Save us from Satan. Take us to a higher level to love you and trust in you and preserve us to never deny you and betray you. And bless my daughters and love them and bring them to me, Father. Bring them to me, Lord Jesus. Bring them to me, Holy Spirit. Have mercy on their mother. Convict her to repent. Bless everyone here. And continue to give me the health and the holiness and the provisions to do this work. You don't need me. I need you. We need you, Abba. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. We love you. Lord Jesus, come sooner than later in Jesus' name. Guys, two big events, February 10, February 19. I need a miracle. Pray God will silence and crush that wicked judge in his righteous wrath. Silence her and muzzle that demon and remove her in Jesus' name. I need God to show up. It's serious now. February 10, February 19. Pray for the provisions. I'm moving in February 15. Pray God will provide and comfort me. And pray for a favor now. I'm going to change my registration, my car registration. So it'll be registered here in the state. Pray for favor. Pray for protection. I got to go now before it closes. I love you guys for the sake of Jesus. And I don't matter. I am nothing. You know who matters? The Father of the Lord Jesus. Jesus, God's Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three persons, the one God, they alone matter. They are in love with you, and they love and adore you. They are in love with me, and love and adore me. Pray we can then love them the way they deserve. Because he is real, Christ is alive, the Spirit lives in us, and the Bible is his word. And he will return and destroy all evil and wickedness and unrighteousness. No more pain, no more suffering, no more misery, no more death. Just basking in the infinite love, joy, and peace of our Father, His Son, and the Holy Spirit. May that do, day be sooner than later. Christ is risen, risen indeed. So pray for my miracle. February 10, February 19. God willing, see you tomorrow in Jesus' name. Take care. And if you want, please fast for me. Pray for Bill Thompson. He's going through something on February 10 to Bill Thompson. He's our brother in the Lord. We love you, Jesus. Amen? Is he amazing or what? The one who can say, God is truly my father. He truly is my father. And I'm truly his son. Wow. Amazing.